tonight on Primetime Politics. Maxime Bernier eyes a return to Parliament. After failing to win a seat in the last federal election, the former Harper minister says he will try to get back to the House of Commons with plans to announce his candidacy in the riding of Portage Lisgar in Manitoba. Coming up, we will hear from Maxime Bernier. Also, our political strategists will weigh in on the move. What impact would an MP and leader from the People's Party of Canada have on Parliament? And... Prime Minister was too afraid to stand up and answer it and debate me. Eight months into the job and Canadians already have expectations of Pierre Poliev, but will those expectations hurt or help the Conservative cause? This is Primetime Politics. I'm Michael Serafio. While a familiar name is planning to stage a comeback in Ottawa, Maxime Bernier, the former industry minister and foreign affairs minister under Stephen Harper, nowadays the leader of the People's Party of Canada. Mr. Bernier has not made it official quite yet, but he does intend to run in the Manitoba riding of Portage Lisgar. An announcement is planned for tomorrow around 11 a.m. Manitoba time. But right now, Maxime Bernier joins us. Mr. Bernier, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. I'm pleased to be with you. Now, your announcement is scheduled for tomorrow, but is it not safe to say that you'll be running since we're talking this evening? I'm not going to uh, Winnipeg and Portage tomorrow to waste my time, if I may say that. Okay, okay, so we'll read between the lines on that one. But, you know, no by-election has yet been called for Portage uh, Lisgar, uh, but, of course, it's being made available with the departure of uh, Candace Bergen. But why run in Manitoba instead of your home province of Quebec? I, I said after the last election, uh, the last uh, general election, that I won't run in both uh, anymore. And, you know, I was looking at that time... Uh, two ridings across the country, uh, <coughs> Timmins in northern Ontario and Portage Lisgard. And as you know, in these two ridings, we did very well. We had a very strong team. And also there's a francophone community. So, um, and now there's a by-election and that's an opportunity uh, to have a candidate uh, elected and in parliament before the next election. So uh, that's why I'm going to uh, Portage tomorrow I'm in Thunder Bay today, and uh, we'll do an announcement. But of course, there's two parts of being a member of parliament. I don't have to tell you. One is being part of a national party, in your case, the leader of a party. Uh, but the other is to actually be a, a member for that riding. What can you actually bring the riding, or is this really just to further the, the People's Party? Yeah, I'm going to bring real conservative values. As you know, the conservative are fake conservative. They're not conservative anymore. The only uh, goal of Pierre Poliev is to be uh, in power. And to do that, he will split the Liberals' vote in big cities like Toronto and Vancouver. So it's an opportunity for people in Portage to uh, Lisgard to send a strong voice in Ottawa fighting for conservative values like, you know, uh, the common sense. Actually, in our, in our society right now, we are promoting uh, kids to transition. I'm using that in brackets because there's not such thing as a little girl won't be able to be a little boy and vice versa. But they all voted for that, all the conservatives, including Pierre Poliev. We need to bring back common sense in Ottawa, and I will do that. And yes, absolutely. Uh, after that election, my goal will be to represent them and to be with them and to live with them, yeah. Okay, so, so let me get some clarity on it then. When, when you use uh, trans children as, as an example, does that mean that the conservatism that you will represent is a social conservatism that you do not think that Pierre Poliev stands for? It, it's a common sense conservatism. It, it's a common sense family values. I'm for free markets. I'm for freedom. As you know, I fought for freedom of choice during the COVID hysteria. I was the only one. I'm for a balanced budget. Poliev won't balance the budget. Uh, he said that he will freeze a budget like that, like that, the big fat government in Ottawa that will interfere in provincial jurisdiction and in our day-to-day -day lives. So oh, okay, but you, used, but you, used, an but you used an example of social conservatism, though, when it comes to trans yeah. issues. So does that mean that's what you'll be standing for, a social conservative party and a social conservative leader? 
No, we are we are a people's party. We will fight for the sovereignty of our country and the right of peoples. And yes, during that campaign, social issues are part also of our platform. You know, it's not only about the economy. When you have a, a cultural war right now in our country, wokeism is everywhere. Uh, when, you know, we are not saying uh, Mr. and Mrs. to, to please uh, uh, the, the trans uh, community, we need to respect them. Now in our society, people are judged by the color of their face or by their sexuality. We must end that. There's no such thing as a positive discrimination. A discrimination is a discrimination. And yes, that would be part of the debate during that by-election. Okay, you, you did mention the, the pandemic as well and standing up for people that were uh, against vaccines, against the regulations and, and the, the limitations, really. Uh, so are you, are you making the argument that there's still a raison d'etre from your party? Because it seemed the last time around, that was really what fueled the, the People's Party, the, the fatigue and the anger uh, of vaccines and health regulations. Absolutely, this party is there. You know, we had 1.6% of the vote in 2017. And, and some commentators were saying this party is dead. And then the last election, we had 5%. And the next one, the next general election, I don't know, but we will grow. So we are speaking about issues that are important for the future of this country, like immigration, for example. All these establishment political parties, including the Conservative and the NDP, are for mass immigration. When you'll have half a million people every year in Canada, starting in 2025, when you're a country of 38 million people, that's mass immigration. We need to have sustainable immigration. That would be important to debate. I don't know what would be the subject of the next general election, but the People's Party is there. You know, I, I spoke about balancing the budget, immigration. I can go on on other subjects, but we have very different policies than the Conservative Party of Canada. Mm -hmm. And so I can tell to people in Portage, you know, if you like our conservative values, vote for them, vote for our values, vote for us. It's a win-win because if Pierre Polyev is acting like a conservative, the People's Party will support him. If not, we will fight for ideas that are important for the future of this country. Uh, quickly running out of time, but I do want to ask you, because you were so very public uh, in your support of the convoy protest when it occupied the parliamentary dis uh, district last year. Uh, we've since heard from the Rouleau Commission. They say that those protests were, at the end of the day, threats to national security. So given that conclusion, do you still support the protest? I don't agree with that conclusion. You know, the judge was another friend of Justin Trudeau. <laughs> so like... Uh, Mr. Donald Johnson that you just appointed to look at the Chinese interference in our election. So, you know, look at the facts. I was there. I was there every weekend. It was not a protest for me. It was a kind of a celebration, a celebration of the end of these draconian measures. So I'm very, I did what I had to do as a leader who is fighting for our charter of oh, the uh, the federal court about it, so we'll know we'll know uh, the details of that when we'll have that judgment soon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I I do want to also get some clarity here. When you say that, you you're mentioning what you describe as a celebration of the parliamentary dis uh, precinct, but part of it was also the blockades at the Windsor Bridge, which had an impact on trade, as well as Coots Alberta, which also raised the issue of uh, of weapons yeah. and an RCMP charge. Do you support those blockades yeah. as well? I, I, I must tell you the bridge in uh, the ambassador bridge, the Ontario government was able to dismantle that without using the Emergencies Act. So Trudeau didn't need to use that, the Emergencies Act. And the police said the same thing, they didn't ask for the Emergencies Act. So Trudeau used it to, <coughs> to, to and if, for, if he, he did uh, froze bank accounts at that time, ordinary Canadians that decided to donate to a legal cause, so you do that in an authoritarian country, not supposed to do that, to do that in, in Canada, but that, that happened. And that's why I was fighting for freedom. And I will always. Maxime Bernier, thank you so much for the time this evening. Really appreciate the conversation. I appreciate your time also. Thank you very much. Well, let's bring in our political strategist now to talk about Mr. Bernier's run. Susan Smith is principal at Blue Sky Strategy Group, Kate Harrison, vice chair of Summa Strategies, and James Valky, director of research and strategy at Viewpoints Research. Hello to the three of you. 
Hi, Michael. Hello. Susan, I'll get you to start us out here. Uh, do you think Mr. Bernier has a chance of taking the riding of Portage Lisgar? And if he does, what would that mean for politics in Ottawa? Well, it'll be a very interesting and I think fairly bloody uh, contest in Portage La Prairie, a conservative safe seat uh, held by Candace Bergen before. And Mr. Mr. Bernier tilts right. And for the Conservatives to beat him and hold on to the vote, they're going to have to tilt right. So if he comes in, regardless, whoever wins that race will have appealed to that part of the party. And that brings that further right wing social conservative voice to Ottawa. The conservative candidates an anti vaxxer he, the, for the nomination ran against the and lost against the or ran and won, sorry, against the Manitoba health minister. So it's going to be a very right wing race. It'll be a question of who out right wings the other. Mr. Polyev's team will have to show the people who might vote Max Bernier that they can do that while at the same time trying to re reassure the rest of kind of middle of the road Canadians that they're not tilting too far right. But I, I feel a crick in my neck tilting in the right direction at this moment watching this race. Oh, well, uh, Kate, uh, to, to you know, give Susan's neck a break here. Uh, if Maxime Bernier does get elected, talk to us about the type of challenge that represents for Conservatives, because it's not just uh, Maxime Bernier, but there's also other groups within the Conservative uh, family that, that wants to challenge right now. Since Maxime Bernier would get more exposure if he's in the House, does that whittle away at the party's base? I, it's a big if, uh, and it is a hypothetical. I uh, I have a, a different perspective than Susan on the the likelihood of of Max and Bernier's return to the House. Uh, keep in mind, uh, he didn't even win the riding for which he was an MP when he ran as PPC leader um, a, a couple of elections ago. Yes, the PPC has done uh, well in Portage Lisker. I think last time they got about 20% of the vote, which is very high compared to other ridings. The Conservative candidate, though, in Candace Bergen still won by a 30-point margin. So I think we're it, it is a big hypothetical. For sure, there's a tension. There always has been within the conservative movement around the right and more of the center. Um, and I think that you know, for for the conservatives, they kind of have to um, stick to uh, what is authentic and true about the the leader and his current policies, which is that that small p populism. Um, you know, we've we've tried a couple Goldilocks approaches along the way of of being quite right and uh, more to the center under Aaron O'Toole. Now this is something different, and conservatives will have to decide and see if it's successful once the next election concludes. Yeah, not an easy task, though, for, for Mr. Polyev, I, I, I would imagine, though, if they're at, going after the same voter base. Yeah, indeed. But I also think that, you know, Max and Bernie's message is really concentrated around uh, COVID pandemic restrictions. He hasn't been as vocal on some of the issues that Canadians are talking about. I don't think that he has really a clear message around cost of living, for example, the housing crisis. Certainly he's vocal on immigration. It's a position that's different than most uh, conservatives that you talk to in Ottawa and one that seems to be different than what Polyev has put forward. So I think that Bernier's candidacy is really focused on that disgruntled group of um, you know, people that were against COVID restrictions. It's difficult to fight an election in 2023 when most of those restrictions were lifted in 2021. So I, I don't see Bernier's support translating into kind of a, a modern movement on the on the right of center. Uh, James, what, what do you think? What kind of impact could Maxime Bernier uh, actually have if he wins this uh, riding? If he wins the riding, it'll have a big impact. I mean, he will. He is the candidate who doesn't seem to go away for the Conservatives. He is a thorn in their side, and he just keeps coming back. Um, I think with the by-election, he is basically removing all the other challenges of other candidates that he had in the federal, and he is increasing his profile once again. Um, I think Fred Delory, he, he wrote a piece on this and said this is a referendum on the Canada conservatism, uh, really raising the stakes about what the outcome of this by-election might mean. Um, however, I think that, you know, what we really have here is a bit of a conservative narrative problem. Are they anti-vax populist or are they establishment pro-Volkswagen investment government in waiting? And if you talk about the Volkswagen investment, you've also got the Oxford by-election coming up, and that was rife with uh, nomination problems too. Um, I think right now it throws a wrench into the Conservatives' narrative, um, and I suspect there's uh, behind the veneer of Pierre's wonderful smile, there's some white knuckles in the party.
Okay. Well, of course, we're going to follow that by-election quite closely, whatever it's called. But I also want to talk uh, about passports while I have the three of you, because as you know, uh, new changes were announced yesterday, the government focusing on the security aspects of this change, but uh, some conservatives taking issue with a redesign that removes images of Vimy Ridge and Terry Fox, just to name a couple. Uh, take a listen to this exchange that happened in the House today. He deletes Terry Fox, the soldiers that died at Vimy, the city of Quebec, the RCMP from our passport to replace it with a coloring book that includes an image of him swimming at Harrington Lake when he was a boy. I announced that a common sense conservative government will bring back Vimy, bring back our memory of Terry Fox, bring back pride in our country and restore a passport that all of us can be proud of. Breaks my heart to hear anyone in this house politicize a Canadian hero like Terry Fox. That is something that the Fox family has prided itself on since Terry passed away in 1980. Not only that, during the convoy, Terry's statue was defaced here in Ottawa, and the members opposite were supportive of that convoy. Okay, Susan, uh, that exchange aside, have Liberals opened, them, opened themselves up to criticism here for, for essentially not celebrating our past? No, 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 no. The passport we've had I'm sorry, you said no. No. <laughs> I think tempest in a teapot. I was trying to think of some nice, fancy alliteration for passport in your pocket and a, and a fuss with a PH, maybe. Um, look. Our passport is the most, most secure travel document we have in the world. It guarantees our identity and our way both in and out into other countries and back home into our own. The current design was done in 2013. The new design uh, has been a process that's underway and it's about security. It's about making sure we have a document that can't be counterfeited, that can't be copied, where our people's identities can't be stolen and the people who aren't supposed to be in Canada, don't get into Canada with Canadian documentation. That's what this is about. I, 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 I'm a bit baffled uh, by Mr. Polyev's attacks on this. I don't, I, I, I don't find it actually that mature, that statesmanlike. It, it, and it seems like not a kitchen table issue for Canadians. We need the most secure documents in the world. We need our ID lasered in. That's what this is about. Uh, passports have refreshes over years. This is the current version, and he should just, um, I don't know, maybe use it to travel across the country and visit some other places in the world and get some perspective about issues that are really important. Well, well you know, Kate, I'll bring you in here because, you know, I, I take what you're saying, Susan, but I have to say, listening to some public radio, I go on the internet and listen to public radio oftentimes <clears> from across the country, and there are Canadians that are very uh, upset that they have removed images of Vimy Ridge and, and, and Terry Fox. So, so Kate, what do you make a, a, of this issue? Yeah, I, I think if you are a traditionalist uh, and a conservative who takes a lot of, of pride in um, national history, you're, you're probably looking at this document and not understanding um, why some of those things would be removed. And I, I mean, I would I agree with Susan that there are bigger fish to fry. Uh, I think one of those fish are actually getting your passport on time. Um, and I think that having this whole redesign distraction, uh, when just last week the government came out and said, you know, we know that the PSAC strike is over, but expect your passport uh, processing to still be delayed. Uh, to me, that's, that's an example of the government focusing more on virtue signaling with things like this, uh, as opposed to actual um, service delivery for Canadians. And it's not just this, Michael, it's things like removing religious symbols from the coat of arms, uh, the whole debate that happened around changing the words in the national anthem. So again, if you're a traditionalist and a conservative, you're looking at these things collectively and wondering why on earth this is the Trudeau government's priority right now. So James, uh, Michael, hang on sorry, a second though. Just, just quickly, Michael, this process was started in 2019 uh, it, it, Kate sort of makes it sound like, oh, they just decided to bring this up and launch this now. That's not, in fact, the case. These are things they that take have, a lot of time to do from a security deferred, perspective. They could have deferred, they could have deferred the rollout of well, such time as more people were getting their passports on time. Yeah. Well, I think, that, but they've also launched as part of this, they've also launched a new online application process, actually. So it does dovetail with people being able to more, uh, more conveniently 
get their passports. Look, I think the conservatives Mike, are making a whole lot of noise out of nothing. Okay, go ahead, James. I know you're trying to Michael, get in there. Michael, this, this, this is a rookie level mistake in year eight of an incumbent government. This should have been a slam dunk. Increase security for Canadians. Everyone's safer. Headline over, end the day, move on. Um, but instead, uh, they were caught flat-footed on something that should have been easily revealed during testing. And what that tells me is that the, the rigors that they've been holding in government are, are, are shaking a little. Like the car is going down the highway, but it's shaking a little bit. And whoever is holding onto the wheel better get it in control real quick. So is this a big issue? I mean, of the top 100 issues Canadians are facing, this wouldn't probably wouldn't make it. But it's issue like this, this week and another little thing next week and another little thing next week that adds to that narrative that that things are kind of not being managed correctly and i think that they need to quash that soon so you see this as essentially an unforced error on be on the part of the government it's an own goal absolutely it is they should have known this they should have been prepared for it and the fact that they were not shows that this they, they, they didn't have the processes in place to to launch it the way they wanted to like it's i do focus groups you show creative all the time and you test against old things and someone would have brought it up why are we getting rid of this and that's a question you should have had prepared and it seemed like they weren't quite ready for that okay uh, i think a focus group if you talk, if you sorry, talk to sorry, anybody sorry sorry one street, at a time susan very quickly quick, very quickly one if you time stop susan. anybody before the street yesterday and ask them were there pictures in their passport i'm not sure they would have said yes let alone being able to identify what was in them people pull out their passports when they're using them otherwise they sit in a safe spot in their safety deposit box or their drawer or their cupboard for wherever they can reach it when they travel uh, kate last word to you it was an own goal that also lines the coffers of their main opposition's pockets. And I think that's the other part of this. There's been so many things in recent months that the Liberals have served up on a silver platter for Conservatives, motivated ones who care about issues like this, to then turn around and donate to Polyev. I'm not sure how tactically that makes any sense for them, uh, for something to Susan's point, that so few people care about to begin with. Okay, well, we'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you for the discussion today. Uh, Susan, Kate, James, take care. Uh, safeguard that passport in your sock drawer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Take care. Bye-bye, guys. Bye. Bye. What would a Conservative government do if they were elected to power? Well, that was the question put to Canadians by the research firm Abacus Data. And to discuss the findings, we're now joined by the chair and the CEO of Abacus, David Coletto. David, good to see you again. Great to see you, Michael. Listen, uh, obviously the Conservatives don't have a, a campaign platform right now, so really no specifics. But I guess this is based on what Canadians uh, have heard from Mr. Poliev and therefore formed an opinion. Uh, talk to us about your polling and what Canadians believe that uh, the Conservative leader would do, would do if he actually were elected Prime Minister. Yeah, and, and really the objective here is to understand what their perception is, right? What what would a government do? You're right, no no real policy has, has been put out there. But there is, you know, some pretty clear signals from people on, on what they think a, a, a Polyev-led government would do. For example, um, you know, a lot of people, more people think that uh, that government would eliminate the national carbon tax, would um, defund the uh, English language CBC, um, and... Uh, almost half of those that have an opinion think that the Conservatives would make it harder for, for women to, to get an abortion, and about the same number think um, it would eliminate the national child care program that, that was established by the Liberals. So those are the four in which you know a sizable number of people have some sense uh, or believe that the Conservatives would do that. Whether they will or not is, is not what's important here. It's what, it's what the public thinks they're going to do. And that, I think, signals, one, uh, how effective they've been at communicating their opposition to the to the carbon tax, which is not new. Uh, previous uh, conservative parties and, and leaders have run on that, um, and it's made a lot of uh, focus on on its its promise to defund the CBC. But beyond that, uh, you start to see where perceptions are on on childcare and and abortion, which is a a real sticky issue for conservatives. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, add to that, and again, based on your research, you've identified, uh, or at least Canadians who took part in the survey, they identified to you their priorities, which they don't necessarily believe that the conservatives will do anything about. Correct. And, and the big ones are uh, housing affordability. Almost every Canadian thinks the government, a future conservative government, should focus on that. Um, taking climate change seriously, um, and, and balancing uh, the federal budget in, in four years, plus, you know, cut my taxes. So on the first two, 
Um, those are two that the Conservatives, I think, have talked a lot about. Uh, for example, housing. Um, you know, you've got Mr. Pelia out there talking quite often about how difficult it is for, for people to buy a home these days. Um, not enough. I think people think the Conservatives are going to do anything about that, but there's an opportunity there for them. Issue like climate change, on the other hand, um, that's a real, I, I think, liability for the Conservatives because, you know, even a sizable portion of those that are going to vote Conservative want the Conservatives to take that issue seriously, but, but not many think that it actually will. Um, so, so that's an issue. Interestingly, when we ask, when we look at the issue of abortion, for example, I mentioned earlier that almost half of those that have an opinion think the Conservatives are going to make it harder for a woman to have an abortion in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, but only one in four uh, Canadians want that to happen. So there's another issue where the perception of what the government, uh, Conservative government would do is, is vastly different than what people want it to do. Okay, so let's pick up on that point then, because here you have Mr. Poliev, who, who really just took over the, the Conservative Party about eight months ago. Given that this is the perception that Canadians have of him right now, after seeing him, seeing him on the job on the Hill, giving his speeches, giving his news conferences, has is this a, uh, or has this been a missed opportunity for Pierre Poliev to, to essentially grow the party base? Well, I think to some extent, I mean, the first thing to keep in mind is is not everybody is, is paying a lot of attention to what, um, you know, Mr. Polyev is even saying. Um, you know, the numbers who are definitely believe that the government, a uh, conservative government would, for example, get rid of the carbon tax isn't isn't that high, given how often they talk about it. So the first thing is to give them a little credit that not everybody is, is fully digesting everything that, that Mr. Polyev is saying. But on the other hand, I do think there are clear signals in this data about where the opportunities are, issues like housing, which they focused on, issues around taxes, which they focused on, um, are, are obvious strengths for the party. But where it gets into trouble, where there's more division, are issues like the CBC, climate change, and, and social issues uh, or, or moral issues like, like abortion. So um, I, I think that, to, your, to answer your question, I, I really think that, that, I don't think they've done everything they, they, they've needed to perhaps to do to, to build that tent, but what they've certainly done is, is, is motivated that conservative base. And I think that's been job one for Mr. Polly is to keep that conservative family together because there are risks with Mr. Mr. Bernier and the People's Party, and, and even this week, we've heard of perhaps a, a new centrist conservative party coming into the mix. So he's trying to keep that conservative family together. Yeah, so keeping them together. But but there is still, as you allude to, an opportunity here to, to grow the base if he what focuses on the issues that identified by Canadians as being priorities for them. Absolutely. Right. And, and those priorities remain the cost of living and housing, um, health care. Um, and 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 taxes, which is part of the the cost of living agenda. So you know, I'm I'm always advising anyone who wants to connect with people and any audiences know what they care about, know what they want you to talk about, and that's that's a clear signal. So there's opportunities here for the conservatives to continue to to differentiate themselves from the liberals, but also to speak to the issues that that most Canadians remain worried about today, and and that's that's really what this survey highlights. David Coletto, appreciate the time. Thank you for this. My pleasure, Michael. Take care. And that is our program for this Thursday evening. I'm Michael Serapio. For everyone here at CPAC, thank you for joining us. Up next, Julie Van Dusen filling in for Esther Bejan at L'Essentiel. But we'll see you again here in Primetime Politics tomorrow.